okay. So, okay. So, <clears throat> hello everyone for the last time <laughs> of, uh, of this learning journey. And I'm still very happy to welcome you um, to this uh, learning journey. Um, for Nicolas, my name is uh, Tony Eur. I'm working as DRR and Climate Change Adaptation Advisor with the Swiss Red Cross. And I'm also a member of the core group of the Swiss NGO DRR platform. If you see the screen, you see the etiquette remarks. And um, I see that, is that true, um, Nora? You have been recording it for quite some time. Okay, good, thanks. Yes. And as we are not many, uh, keep your, you don't even need to keep your mics muted, uh, but keep your camera on at all times. Um, and um, we can ask questions by raising the hand, using the mic, but also the chat. We are enough to have a look, enough persons to have a look at the chat every once in a while. Um, <clears throat> now this time it's the right slide. <laughs> <laughs> because it's definitely the fifth module of the second part of the learning journey, the second part um, of the module focusing on GIS, and the last module of this two-year-long uh, learning journey. And hi, Georg. Um, sorry, we just missed um, on the... And he, he left again. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that's it from my side. Um, don't need to share it longer and don't need to make it longer because we have Andrea with us. Andrea, who is the facilitator of the two modules on uh, GIS. And um, I hand over to you, please, Andrea, you have the floor. I'll try. OK, so. what you just said. Um, thank you for the introductions, Tony, and for organizing the online meeting as such. Um, yeah, welcome to this second session uh, about GIS or with the uh, main focus on GIS. Um, as Tony just introduced, uh, we'll be looking at the data analysis and visualization part. Um, and first, maybe quickly for those who didn't join, who had joined two weeks ago, uh, where we had left off last time, uh, we had looked at editing and digitizing data in OpenStreetMap, an open source tool, um, web-based, um, that would allow us to edit features in, for, in shapes of lines, points, and polygons, which were then labeled as uh, fountains, gardens, pools, buildings, roads, and rivers, anything you want is basically available there already in a nice feature library. I gave then also a quick overview of QGIS, which was not required to be installed for last session, but in this session, it would be great if you would have managed to install QGIS since it's gonna be quite hands-on as you will see qjs is a desktop gis geographic information system or software um, unlike openstreetmap which is a web-based this one is desktop based one has to properly install it takes up some space and ram when you do stuff with it etc um, yeah and this is where we are continuing today we shared with you uh, on the last email or the, I think the invite. Um, again, the, the guideline or the little guide on how to install um, QGIS um, and also a zipped GIS project folder. I hope that came through via the WeTransfer link that I shared with you. Um, that project folder contains again multiple subfolders where of we have four zero one raw data contains some data in, term, in form of shape files and um, 
raster format that we will be using to start our project. Process data already contains a couple of layers as well, just in case you lose track or, or got lost uh, while trying to push your own buttons and checking what I am doing. And in 03 project files, there are two GIS projects, one's called exercises and one final. In the exercise one, it's that's the one that you basically see here. Pretty basic, nothing's pretty about it. Um, the layers and are not styled or formatted or analyzed in any sort of way that would be telling us something because that's what we're going to work off from. And uh, then there is the final QJS project file, which contains a bit more sophisticated version with everything already in it, including a layout file uh, to actually then print it to a map. So if ever you get totally lost, feel free to just switch to this final version and there you have more data available to uh, follow again. Then we have the 04 outputs folder where you could put in, for example, a PDF or a PNG of any maps that we are creating. This folder structure is something I made up. You are entirely free to design your own sort of structure. It's not tied into the actual QGIS setup or the, that the software would require that. That's not the case. So you're free to do whatever, also work without any folders. However, it can get quite convoluted as you'll see. And uh, I sort of prefer to have more, more or less a system to more or less find my stuff again once I need it. Um, what's good to have though is if you always leave your projects file sort of in the same hierarchy compared to the data you're using. Otherwise you risk that it loses the relationship. So from when you would open then the QJS project file here, it may not recognize where actually the data that it needs to show lives in, in which folder or in on which server or drive, uh, etc. So it's better to sort of keep a package together. Good. And with that, uh, we can basically go ahead. And if you want, if you manage to install QGIS, don't hesitate to just double click the QG set file exercises and uh, let QGIS open that file for you. I'm sorry, I have installed yep. QGIS, but I do not have this, uh, these files. No, uh, maybe no. we should share the link again. Yeah, yeah in <clears throat> the transfer link has expired um, in the meantime. Huh? Ah, Probably if you great. share it in the chat, then people can go and yeah. get it again, if it's still okay. um, working. Let me just... When you were Sharing. now yeah. just describing it, I, ha I had to go back in my download to go and uh, get them. <laughs> I forgot them there, but as I have downloaded it before, so um, I have. Yeah, them. yeah. you can also leave it in the downloads folder. That's of course not a problem. Let me, I might just need to create quickly a new one. But everyone else managed to um, install QJS or, or get their IT to do so. Yep. Cool. So maybe good. Um, <laughs> um, Christina, if if you're the only one who does not have it, I also downloaded it in the in the share web. But probably takes as long as the transfer from Andrea for me to get the link. But I'll I'll put the link also in the in the chat. Huh? Then you can just access it there. I'll be quick. 
It's just 20 megabytes, so that should. Copy link. And now where are we again? Voilà. Okay. Do all of you need to download it from there first? Because otherwise we give it quickly a couple of minutes. I have it. It's quick. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Are you equipped? Not that I already lose you now. <laughs> <laughs> We're all fine. Okay, good. And it I'll somehow continue. worked with them, um, with the GIS application. Perfect. Okay, Zach, where were we? Cool. Good. It's what you received, as I said. Um, I unzip that folder and then double click the exercises project file, which you find in zero fee project files. While QJS is opening your project, um, we can maybe quickly look at what the plan is for today. I'm not sure if we are getting through everything or yeah, if certain things become complicated along the way, but uh, first we'll start with adding some data, clipping data to the extent uh, of interest, etc., cetera. Um, and then we'll start using some analysis tools for terrain visualization and hopefully being better able to understand more about the terrain we're looking at. Um, and then we'll create a slope gradient map. And then we'll try to estimate uh, the areas that potentially could get flooded. Um, you will see the approach we are doing today is not the easiest one, but that's also a bit due to the terrain that was chosen, um, where I decided to stick to the to the valley we were in last time, and that also Georg um, did the the analysis on and probably has even the better data than what we're going to do, but I think there will be some overlap and match. And we'll also talk about easier ways and solutions to do that, for example, in flat terrain, etc. Okay. If the QGIS project now opened for you, you can click on project properties. And that's where we actually find how our QGIS project is set up. I'm quickly showing it on the slide, but feel free to browse around a bit through the project properties where um, most important is basically under the general tab, the first one, that we have the location properly defined, that we have a project title, and that we have safe paths set to relative. Relative is always good because then if you're moving your project package around, it the actual file, the QJS file, this um, QG set file will always recognize where it finds the actual data it has to work with. The other option is absolute, but then you probably end up losing the connections between the data and your project, and then you'll have to either reset it every time or you risk to um, lose over you entirely. So relative, at least for these type of applications, is the way to go with. If we scroll a bit further down, you can choose the types of uh, measurement units that you want to work with. Be that yeah, 
in meters or feet, etc. And then a second important part of this here, where today basically none of these are interesting for us. However, there is the CRS um, tab, which stands for coordinate system. And this is where we want to make sure that it is set to this uh, Soridoma carrier um, projection with the code 3857. This is a very common projection for any WebGIS applications, and we ended up with this one because we're working with um, OpenStreetMap data that ultimately comes from the web. Of course, we are free to choose any projection that we want. Many countries have their own because they want to preserve a certain shape distance, shape distance or um, look of the of their country, um, whatever is most important for them. But within the three conditions, uh, only ever two can be fulfilled. So one, it's a matter of uh, yeah trade off uh, what you're giving up on. And we all know with the pseudomercury that we have, we can see it down here on the world map. Yeah, there is definitely distortion because the, the sizes between the continents and the countries definitely don't match what's happening in real. Um, but therefore, the shapes are pretty correct apart from the Arctic regions. But this we're working with today, and it's all based on the WGS84 uh, ellipsoid, which is sort of, yeah, the base ellipsoid on, on which then the elevation is based on. That's basically your mean sea level. Every time someone talks about mean sea level height, that means uh, from this sort of shape that is generated by using this algorithm that is called WGS84 satellite data, etc., GNSS data, it all uses this, this layer. And it's also going to be good enough for what we are doing, maybe not to put, to build a house with, but um, for, for what we are interested in for pure visualization and analysis and better understanding, this will do. Good. <clears throat> Then, uh, zip, zip, zip. QGIS plugins. We won't actually do that today in order to save time. Voila. But I quickly explain anyhow. At the top, there is a section called plugins where we can click on manage and install plugins. And that opens a little window where we can search for any type of plugins that uh, can be useful. In our case, for example, there is the quick OSM. Yeah, now it doesn't show me because it's already installed. Yep. Here, quick OSM. This is a plugin that you can install into your QGIS uh, in order to download OSM data directly um, from the web within QGIS without going into OSM on the web first, uh, selecting a section and then uh, exporting it. Um, this is a way to directly get OSM data into your QGIS project. Very useful. Then the other one, is the SRTM downloader, where SRTM stands for Shuttle Radio Topographic Mission. That means there is a radar sensor somewhere on a satellite and goes around the world and collects elevation data. And this data is stored on NASA servers and you can pull it from there. You can install this plugin and again, it lets you directly download elevation data into your QGIS project. Quite useful. In general, 
if we look here at the layout a bit for a second, we have the map canvas where with your mouse, you can uh, scroll and move uh, the map layout in and out as far as you want, as far in as you need. Um, we have on the left hand side bottom, the layers window will be working a lot with that today. That's basically where you can any data that you want to visualize here in the map canvas will be displayed in here. I can maybe demonstrate that by turning on and off the area of interest rectangle that we see here with the red boundary. Then just above, we have the browser panel. This is where we can pull data from that sits in a database or a so-called web map service or web map tile service. <coughs> or then the data that you have now locally somewhere on your computer, respectively your uh, QGIS project. However, it's almost easier to just drag and drop stuff from your folder in directly into the layers pane than actually going uh, searching through your browser directory. Then at the top, we have toolbars. You see, they, they can be arranged as you want, as you like. One can also grab these little bits here and drag things all over the place and arrange them to uh, whatever layout you prefer. We'll be using some of those. Yep. Oh, and maybe just so you're aware, at the bottom of the map canvas, you see the coordinates. If you move your mouse throughout the canvas, you see the coordinates changing. You see what scale you're at. And when you're zooming, the scale changes. And you can also set the specific magnifier or a rotation. Currently, it's just set up so that the top of your map canvas is north. On the right hand side at the bottom, you also see the EPSG code. Good. I think if I have it in reading, yeah, this will be better. Good. Then you can stay in your QGIS tool. I just want to point out some useful tools. And in order to do so, um, maybe the slide is better. There is the identify feature tool with this little info sign and an arrow, where if you select that and click anywhere in your map canvas uh, on any of the features or things that you see on the right hand side, there will be a little window opening that tells you what layer you're right now seeing and what's the value of the feature that you clicked on. Then in the top toolbar, there is a couple of these yellowish looking um, icons, which are all indicating um, selection tools. We can select by area, by attributes. You can delete your selection or you select by uh, location. This is super useful to select features in whatever feature class you want. And then like here, for example, the little road here shown in red uh, was selected. You can then right click on your layer in your layers panel and say export safe feature as, and this will allow you to extract only that feature from this very big or potentially very big feature class um, road. And then you can work with this one road of which you maybe know the name. You will see such an example uh, with the river that we're going to work with. And if ever you get lost, <laughs> then the easiest is to go in your layers panel, select, for example, in our case, the area of interest layer, 
right click and just right at the top it says zoom to layer and then it will adjust your map canvas view to exactly the extent of that file. Just below is a zoom to selection, which could also be useful if you're working with such with the selection tools. Okay, good. Um, then we want to start adding some data. I'll give you a quick overview and then we'll do it. Um, first, we're going to add data coming from a server. We're going to actually load a base map that comes from OpenStreetMap. Now, it's just a drag and drop of layers, and then we'll add the building and river shape file that is in the 01 uh, raw data folder. And then some raster data, raster as in TIFF files, uh, which contain elevation data and satellite imagery. So, okay, good, that's better. Good. So in order to import this first data set or yeah, the base map, we want to go onto XYZ tiles in our browser panel and then find OpenStreetMap and we can just take that and drop it into the layers panel. And you see it threw it right at the top of the list of all layers. That's a bit unpractical because we want to ultimately see our other layers. And since this is the base map, this is actually the layer we want at the very bottom. Voila. You see now in this case, it, now I can zoom out. And I have, uh, I can see properly where I am. And it automatically loads the data from the internet. Of course, this only works if you have an internet connection. This symbol here next to OpenStreetMap means that it is a raster layer. So right now, if we would uh, zoom in on a feature or so, like here, this building, you see, I cannot, if I go onto my info sign if i click on it nothing really happens it doesn't show me we can't identify a feature because it's sort of hidden inside this raster layer where it's just a raster created out of a vector data and just made easy for us to actually display or use it as a background map then Checking, yeah, correct. So now we want to add our shapefile building and the, the river um, where we find the data in the, maybe we can turn this off. Yeah. We find this data inside the 01 raw data folder. And here you need to grab from the buildings shape file building.shp. Important to understand about the shape file is that actually everything that's called building here is one shape file. However, it's the shp file that refers to the other four. Careful when you're moving those around, you always have to move the entire group of files. If you're losing some of these files on the way, you're you're corrupting your shapefile. So just click on it, drag and drop. I already throw it somewhere. I put mine now in the raw data group. It's sort of a layer group, like you have group layers in PowerPoint drawing or um, in any other painting software where you want certain things show on top of other things or be able to turn off all at once. That's it. Same thing we're doing with the Emma River. Grab dodge shape and drag and drop. 
game. What could be the reasons that the drag and drop does not work? Mm. Are you dragging the .shp file? Yes. <laughs> Sorry to... for the stupid questions, but uh, that's a <laughs> software life, right? <laughs> we have to put up with this. Um, <laughs> um, drag and drop does not work. Are you dragging it into the layers panel too? Um, Do you get any other error message anywhere in your window? No, it just doesn't really recognize it, I feel like. Does it show you the name, but you don't see it in your map canvas? Um, or did it... Show. Did it disappear in one of these group layers accidentally? Mm. Oh. No. <laughs> <laughs> but go on, go on, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, just, to, just to flag that I have also a problem with opening yep. anything and it tells me that the, the version, the, uh, um, there is a new uh, QGIS version than the one I downloaded two weeks ago, apparently, mm. and now it does not fit with these files. I assume it should not can... matter. No, it's it's uh, okay. up and down compatible, especially with these type of files. So you can just click OK the the update message. That should not matter. And also, there was technically no new version since two weeks ago. So that's a bit funny, but it should. Mm -hmm. But it says easy. that it cannot install everything and actually nothing works. <laughs> install? <clears throat> well, open. Uh -huh. I have already closed the, the warning message. I can't find it. Anymore. I have it. I have it. But to me, it, it seems that it's working. But what I cannot do anymore is um, move move the, um, the, the map. I get, I get, as you get there, I get this, um, this sign and then it, I cannot move it. I can only make it bigger or smaller, but not move it. Mm. And what type of sign? Um, sorry for, ah, um, yeah. Um, and the, the, it, it says the project that I wurde mit einer neueren Version von QGIS. Erzeugt und konnte nicht komplett geladen werden. I think that's the same problem as uh, Christina. Exactly. Had. Yeah, that's what he ah. said. But the Emma River is down. Uh, I see it, you know, and when I click on it, I see it uh, then as uh, identification, but nothing with the building. No buildings. But what did, did you also have to say if you want nicht verfügbare Layer behalten oder nicht verfügbare Layer entfernen no, oder Auto like finden? No, yeah. no. You can do nicht verfügbare Layer um, weg. <laughs> also, we, the, all the layers are still available in the project folder, so we can just add them in case they now dropped out. You can just open Maybe if you just OK the message um, mm. saying that you're OK with it, uh, dropping the layers it cannot reference right now or not uh, show. Mm -hmm. The buildings layer should technically also work. I mean, you can. Always, what? I mean, it's not if you, a problem. If you go on it, you know, how, what do you see? How do you see that it's working on the identify results? You should see something or not. Either that or you turn off all the others. By just oh. unchecking. Okay. Yeah. Cool idea. <laughs> well, oh, there yeah, are a million see, ways yeah, yeah, of yeah, doing yeah. stuff. Okay. Um, it's, okay. There is no right or wrong anywhere. It's... Um, yeah, it's good, good, good. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. If yeah. if you are losing any capabilities of zooming in or out, it's the hand pan map that you can switch to in case you were on some other. Up there, someplace. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Good. Sorry. Up here. Basics. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, they are important. <laughs> Sometimes one tends to skip them. Um, and Zoom buttons, of course, are available here too. Uh, Zoom to full extent is also possible, but sometimes, yeah. yeah, it's okay. We're not going too far away. And as I said before, if you now, like if we lose ourselves, we have no idea anymore where we are, just right click on one of those layers and say Zoom to layer, and then you're back where you were. Okay, Zoom to layer. Ooh. Were we able to solve some problems? If that project file now doesn't work at all, you are free to also use a new project up here. Like you just open QGIS, a blank version. If you type in your search QGIS, and you open QGIS desktop, voila, then you end up with the same interface just without anything. And then you click here. I'm not going to do it, but the, <laughs> uh, you then say uh, that you want to uh, create a new project. And then you end up, you just won't have any layers here on the left. And then you can just go ahead and drag all the layers from the zero one folder over. And then you should see them as well. Not a problem. And the open street map layer you're dragging anyhow from the browser panel down. Now, okay, I turn on the the AOI is sort of our reference, the area of interest. We want to work just within within this uh, rectangle. Um, and now we can, for example, style our buildings a bit because green buildings uh, doesn't seem. Uh, very logic. We already have a lot of green for nature, as in uh, fields, forests, etc. So, well, double click on the buildings layer, which takes us into the properties of the layer and also directly to the symbology tab. And this is where we can sort of either pick from a predefined style or we can change to whatever color. We want it to change to. I'm going to click here on gray, do the lazy version, click on apply or OK. If you click OK, it closes the window. So sometimes apply will just give you another option to, to quickly check if that's really the color that you would like to see for your buildings on the map. Same we can do with the river. We technically have the river already here just as part of the open street map raster layer that's not going to be practical for us however and then we can yeah choose blue see apply okay we can of course change um the width of our river to whatever we want to as well And now, if you're going, now we want to still add our raster layers where we want to, uh -huh, where we see, yeah. This one is the elevation data, the SRTM. We can drag and drop as well, yeah, into the raw data group or, or just somewhere down the bottom because it's quite big and we can okay. do the same thing with the satellite one and then you should end up with something like this satellites 
satellite Sentinel-10 meters. So it's Sentinel, the satellite is called Sentinel, um, and it just takes images at the resolution of 10 meters. Did you manage to get sort of this far? The satellite data is already clipped to the extent that we wanted because I didn't want to make the project for you guys uh, too big uh, <laughs> to share um, because uh, anything that's RGB sort of imagery data can make these projects very big and heavy um, and then it becomes complicated to to transfer data. It's more for a visual background. So I'm going to put this here together with my OpenStreetMap layer. And now I only see right now my elevation layer and uh, AOI buildings and river. And in the background, the OpenStreetMap layer. What I want to do now is clip this very big elevation layer here to the extent that we're interested in. Because if once we're running analysis, et cetera, and, and we are constantly running it on the entire extent of this big elevation layer, then we're wasting time and resources and just make things complicated. So it's easier to actually clip um, this layer to the extent of our area of interest. For that, we need to do two things. First, we need to quickly check what the projections are of these two. If I double click on my um, area of interest layer and click on information this time, don't even need to scroll down, my screen's big enough. I can see here on the coordinate reference system that it is in our projection that we want to work with. And now I need to make sure that this is also the case for the elevation data. Information, scroll down a bit. And you see this is a different number, so that's not good. <laughs> it's actually not even projected. So what we have to do now is use a tool to put this layer into the same projection in order no, not to compare apples with peers, so called. So this is not hard to do. For that, we just go under raster projections, warp or reproject. And this opens this little tool for us where the layer that we are on is already selected. Just double check again that it's really the layer that you want to work with. Currently, this layer is in just WGS84, 4326, 4326. And we want it in the target CRS, the target coordinate system of the Mercator projection of 3. Eight five seven. We don't even need to worry about the rest of the inputs here. We just need to scroll down and we see reprojected save to temporary file. We can leave it as is. We don't need to have this file <laughs> saved um, to our project folder right now. It can just live within the QGIS uh, project since we're only going to use it very shortly. So temporary file, if 
we click on run, it executes the tool and gives us a reprojected file. We can close the tool. If we zoom out, nothing has really happened apart from this layer having been thrown on top of the other so we don't see anything anymore. If we turn it off, it looks like before just because we have our original elevation layer still on. If I turn that one off and now turn our reprojected elevation layer on, we'll end up here. Second step, we need to go on the raster and clip, find the clipping tool. Uh, yeah, extraction, and here we select clip raster by mask layer. By opening this tool, we make sure we have this reprojected layer stated up here, and our mask layer is now going to be our um, area of interest rectangle. Check. We don't need to worry about anything else since it's all in the correct projection, but this time we want to save it to an actual file. We say save to file. And here we want it to be, I need it to be in my other. Yeah. And I put it under processed. I'm sorry for not having written processed properly. <laughs> and now we can write here elevation data. You see there is already an elevation data layer in there. So in case you're totally lost, feel free to grab that one. And um, I just call this one number two uh, in order not to overwrite it, but you can also choose to overwrite it. That's not a problem. Click on save. And now run the tool. And if we close it, we will see now here zooming in that there's one on top of the other. And we can actually, now we don't need this reprojected layer anymore. It's temporarily saved anyhow, so we can just remove it in order to keep our view from cluttering. Even the original large elevation layer we don't need anymore. If you want, you can just click on remove layer. Voila. Our elevation data tool, or I don't know if you renamed it. Um, I'll just try. Yeah. Yeah, it can live here or in the raw data or processed if you want. Yeah, it's a bit. We'll be using this one a lot. You can double click it. We go in symbology to make it look a little bit prettier or for us a bit more understandable by selecting. Hmm. Yeah, a single band pseudo color and we can select a color ramp that we like. Say apply and OK and we end up with this sort of look. Are people still with me? Or do I need to show something again? I am lost, I have to admit. <laughs> Where are you lost? Um, somehow at the second last, um, not that this one, but the one before, I. I was still a bit busy with something else and then I didn't know what you were doing. <laughs> it asked the projections. Do, did you did you do the projection? No. No. Okay, so. uh, anybody else is okay. If I'm the only one, then but um yeah. Well, either I can go through it again, or then you can also just uh, select your elevation layer. Yeah, no, I'm getting lost. From a zero two processed data folder, there is one called elevation data. This one is already clipped and potentially even shows up 
correctly colored or nicely colored um, if you just drag and drop it in. TIFF. Yeah. Elevation data dot TIFF. In CO2 process data. I have TIFF dot AUX. Yeah, this one. Yeah. Yeah. Somehow. The other one is not a TIFF, but it has a TIFF um, kind of um, sign ahead. So it's the other one. Yeah. Yep. There's and also just... hill, shade, and slope. They they basically also show the elevation, and this is what we're going to create right after this. Uh -huh. So I just drag and drop it down yep. to the layer. Yeah. And if it's still black and white, just double click mm -hmm. on it. In symbology, you can select a single band pseudo color where that gives you the option to select a color ramp, it's called. I also I have that stuff um, on on German. Ah. That makes it more <laughs> it a bit hard. <laughs> See, like I cannot watch you when I do it. That's the problem. Yeah, yeah, I know. That's why this is all recorded. <laughs> and so once you I'm have the recording, okay. Yeah, Single, so huh? yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. And I don't have any colors here. <laughs> um, don't forget to click apply at the bottom. Um, unvent another so. Uh, yeah. Did it give you or did yeah? I don't have this. You don't have this one middle part. One color ramp, Fartfellow. I don't have anything. Oh, I I have to choose in the yeah. in the color ramp. I have to choose something. Huh? Here, yeah, you should choose something. Well, it also gives you, uh, it just suggests something as well. Right. And what happens with that's nothing. Uh, do you have numbers and colors here in the middle? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. I have the same like what you have there apparently. Perfect. Then it should go apply and OK. Yeah. And now you just need to make sure that your layer is not covered by another one. If you have so if you have this one below the open street mm. map or satellite, then of course you will not see it. You can also move it to the very top. Then it will overlay other stuff, but at least you can see it. What could also do you have the open street map layer on? Yeah. And you see see where you you are in the right location. You're above the two lakes here and Yeah, but you know my yeah. this uh, elevation stuff is um covering it a bit. Huh? It's still and I don't yeah, want to I don't want to, you know, to 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 pirate you, you know, just <laughs> just go ahead. I'll <laughs> yeah. I'll manage it then the second time I'm uh, so the I'll elevation it, data yeah. just needs to be there. If right now it's on top for me as well, on top of the open street map data. But that works just fine for me right now. I don't need it different. We can also set transparencies and other stuff. I'll just put it down a bit so we have it this way. Cool. Okay. So in the next step, um yeah you see i have all the steps as well for you guys here on the slides so if the video or the recording is afterwards hard to follow uh, you can also use here the slides and i'll be giving you some more guides to follow through after okay. because now we want to start doing a bit of 
analysis by using some of the very easy uh, tools. You have to share your screen again, sorry. Oh, did I? Uh, I had it. Yeah, yeah, but I made, I messed up. I wanted to show you something. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see it. Hmm. It right now doesn't let me select it. Ah, maybe. Are you still sharing? No, no. It's the same as last. Hmm. It's coming I now. See. Yeah, it's good. OK. Were there any more messages? I'm sorry if I'm sharing my entire screen. I don't see what you're writing as messages. <laughs> so if there were any questions that I missed, maybe. Um, Christina, she left because she cannot practice on her end. She said she, she cannot open the file. OK. Yeah. And Nicolas, uh, just ask your questions. We are so few, you know, just ask it, you know. Step in and ask it, not not in the chat. Yeah, I was just wondering about the frequency that Sentinel satellite is uh, flying over the same region. Uh, it certainly does. I'm not sure exactly what its uh, frequency is. Um, if it's uh, twice a year that it covers the entire world or once a year. Um, okay, but something some, like but that. that would I, that's what I would sort of expect, yeah. And you should also be able to get maybe net. Yeah, you have to dig a bit for the sources, but you should be able to get um, data from last year, this year, or even like further back, and then be able to do change detection on it uh, or comparisons on how an area uh, changed. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It's just a uh, ten by ten meters. If you zoom into the Satellite image, you will see it will not be super pretty. Yeah. You see, it's yeah. uh, that's sort of the limit. So one recognizes where there is forest, mountain, and um, buildings to some extent, but uh, or, or snow, but that's about the limit for and. 10 meters is already very high resolution for satellite imagery. Um, you might get for one or the other place five meters, but if you want really high resolution, um, you often need to uh, go to um, to drones, which can fly lower and therefore uh, collect images that that have a higher resolution or of better quality or show more detail. Thank you. Or 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 aircraft as well. Then you get. Aircraft data is usually around 30 centimeters, 25 to 30 centimeters per pixel. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. Elevation data. We want to do this one. Yeah. So we want to quickly look at um, raster elevation outputs. So terrain analyzers do some very basic analysis. Um, where we're going to create a hill shade, a slope, and a contour output. Again, if you get lost, uh, those files are also available in the project folder. Oh, now I click that again. Um, yes, so here we go under raster analysis and we want to select hill shade as a first. Hill shade. Um, I wouldn't know the German word right now. Relief, maybe, or um, if you Neigung. open it, Neigung. Neigung. That would be slope. That that's the next one that we're doing. Oberflächenrauigkeit. Huh? Can that hill shade? No, it's not. That's not hill shade. <laughs> Let me see. Let me see what what you have there. We have roughness. After the grid, it's hill shape, and then you, Schummerung. 
<laughs> Maybe you want to change that to English. <laughs> yeah, I try, but you know, it, it, I'm not the administrator, you know. Ah, uh, right. <laughs> okay. True. <laughs> yeah, Schumerung sure, could be. Okay, yeah. Oh. Right. Let, let me see where you come. Then, Wor you know, worst case, the it doesn't look exactly the same. That's about it's not yeah, a big deal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the, since the the masks here to input uh, what you need, uh, they're all the same. We want to just make sure that it now has the elevation data here that we clipped. So yeah. If we're scrolling down, yeah, there's nothing for us to do. You can. Well, you can make it a temporary file or you can make it a, a proper file. I can just make it heel shade two. Save. And then I click run. Close. And voila. Again, it's right on top uh, of everything else. So we don't see the other things anymore. We can move this if we want to the processed folder. Make sure you have the tick set on the processed folder in order for the layer to actually show. If you uncheck for the group or for the layer, they disappear. Did that work for one or the other? Yes. Cool. We can go to the same place, raster analysis slope. Now that would be Naigung, Tony. And then we open this tool. Again, have the elevation data mentioned here. Um, here we just want to make sure. Yeah, no. So it's going to automatically show the slope um, of the hills in um, degrees, but you could choose to also have it shown in percentage. But we'll be working with degrees, I think. Well, and again, scroll down and then save to file we want to do number two Flip. Flip. run and i created this sort of bit of wormy looking thing for us do we need a break well we do one more there's one more easy one like that. And that we will be it. we can do it. Yeah. And the raster again analyzes and we're gonna create some oh no, sorry, not on the analysis, but extraction. So raster extraction contour. If we open this mask, we make again sure that the input layer is the elevation data. And then here, this is kind of the most important value here, the interval between the contour lines. You can have a line every 10 meters. So for every 10 meters of elevation change, you will get a line or we can set it to 25 then we don't get too many lines. Um, maybe stays a bit more. Uh, save to file. To save. And run. If we close, you see we get all these wiggly lines all over the place. Can also put this one on the processed. Contours are always useful 
for your final map outputs and make them look a bit more comprehensible or give some 3D information while not losing, for example, the some, some, some. So that way you still see the river and sort of the the data from the OpenStreetMap layer, plus at the same time the contour lines give you an idea of what is happening um, in terms of uh, terrain. We can uh, double click the contours layer, go under symbology. I'll make mine a bit less white and brown is sort of the usual color. Contour lines, say OK apply and voila you see we have contour lines here but not on this side that is outside our area of interest because that's not where we run the the algorithm on good shall we give it a quick break Or is everyone up for pushing more buttons? We do 10 minute break. I'll stick around for if you have questions or need to catch up or are lost. <laughs> Um, Andrea, yeah. I think I I missed one step. I don't. I cannot hide or cannot hide the contours in the layers because I don't find the contours. There. Maybe I think I missed a step. You can't see them. Yes, they should be in the layers list. Technically, yes, it can be that they're hiding inside a, a group again, or mm -hmm. they are underneath uh, uh, your elevation data, for example, or so. You can also try to like, tick off everything else but your contours. Mm -hmm. Or right click if you see the layer on your layers panel right click uh, on contours and say zoom to layer which is at the very top of that very long list hmm. no i just have it mine is called raster mask Contours. Uh, it's okay, I think. <laughs> if you don't find them at all, either try to run the tool again on the raster extraction contour, or uh, it's also in the 02 process folder, and you can just drag and drop the sort of the original, the provided mm. one. Perfect. <laughs> Can I also benefit from the from the break? Just uh, yes, to of give course. me a hand. Yeah, I'll share yeah. I'll share my screen, you know, and then okay. you will see where I'm I'll lost. Say stop. Um. Oh, that look good. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't look good. I I think the one or the other. Um, I messed I messed up in one or the other stuff. But I, I I understood that you know we can put the stuff from raw to processed, but I'm not sure if if everything is okay here, and what I'm, I have too much, you know. No, no, it's fine. I would don't be too concerned with that. It's more an I to give you an idea that you can do that because over time. But how how do I get how do I come to the same picture as you have? You know that it looks kind of normal. <laughs> you just turn off 
ihre Neigung und Schummerung. And also elevation data, turn it off. Um, go down, yeah, and then land use, road. Uh, road, you can leave land use, turn off. Yeah. And uh, bring the satellite image um, down to just above OpenStreetMap. This one. Yeah. Yeah, better. You can also turn it off, depends on what type of background you want. Yeah. yeah that okay, looks really so good. that's what yeah. you have as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. super good, yeah, at the right spot. Okay, thanks <laughs> a lot. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so, now, from all those three terrain outputs that we created, um, let's try to uh, use a bit more the slope or the Neigungskarte and create, uh, try to make this uh, useful in some way because uh, slope can be very interesting since um, depending on the steepness of the slope, one can easily identify areas that are more prone to avalanches or landslides. And basically, have in a very simple way um, a, a hazard map established. Of course, that ignores vegetation and soil, et cetera, and rain. But uh, for a first start, that can be an interesting output. And for that, we will be using for the first time the toolbox. So in our project, um, let me turn on here this one. Let me put the open treatment layer on so we know where we are. Um, but the toolbox we find under processing here at the top and click on toolbox and then it will open on the right hand side here, this panel called toolbox. I reduce a bit my identify results window, or I can even close that. We don't need it right now. And we want to work with this slope layer. If you don't have it yet or the process before didn't work, feel free to just grab it from the 02 processed folder. In the search here, we type, you see there are a lot of tools available. Type reclassify. And then we'll grab this tool here called reclassify by table. So this one is a bit more complex as a tool. We want to make sure that our slope map is selected as the raster input layer. The band number is one that's okay, no need to worry about. Reclassification table, that's where we need to be active and need to click here on this three little dot C a square, which opens another section of the parameters window. Here we need to add the amount of rows or class by the amount of classes that we want. So we want to create four classes. One, two, three, four. And we need to write now the values or the value range for each class. So for example, on this first class, we want to go, we want to showcase everything from zero to 30, to, uh, sorry, 15 degrees. Zero to 15. 15 to 30, 30 to 45, 45 to, and that's just because I know um, the max value uh, of this output here that we have in the background is 71 degrees. We can find that out in the properties layer of the slope map. 
now I just knew by heart and you can follow me for that. That's OK. Now these are the ranges in order then to have a name for each class. We can, for example, say, OK, this is the 15 degree class. This is the 30 degree class, 45. And the 71. Once we have that, we can click OK. Did everyone manage? Or did we get lost in translation or something? I don't have that toolbox on the right side. I have another one. At the top, can you click on processing and click on toolbox there? Processieren, or I don't know what says in German. Bearbeitung, Werkzeugkiste, okay. Werkzeugkiste, yeah, yeah that yeah. sounds pretty good. Yeah. Sorry, and then you just have to tell me again. Yeah, um, the Werkzeugkiste opened now for you. Yeah. yeah. Now there is a, a search um, yeah. bar at the top. Now the tool is called reclassify in English, but I unfortunately have no idea what it would be in German. Yeah, um, something similar to I don't see. I glaube, es heißt uh, Rasteranalyse und dann reclassify by table. Hat es sie? Yeah, yeah. Ich, yeah. I have it in German too. That's uh, at least that's what okay. I opened. I hope it. Rasteranalyse and then what did you what did you use there? By table. Aha. Nach Tabelle, huh? Yeah, genau. yeah. Okay, then I'll just see what you have there. Reclassify the by layer. table. Yeah. No, Neigungs here. This uh, yeah. the Neigungskarte muss hier sein. Huh? Yeah. Neigung. Band 1 is good. Yeah, yeah, okay. Table. Here, click on the three dots. Mm -hmm. I, yes. And then you're here. And now you can enter the min and max values. No, and it's rift, huh? I chose these ranges because actually 15 to 30 degrees uh, is a is a slope angle at which, for example, slow uh, snow <laughs> tends to collect or build up in higher regions. Um, but it would still be steep enough to then uh, trigger gravitational forces causing an avalanche. So anything between 15 to 30 degrees, of course, also higher, but uh, that's as low as it gets, uh, can already trigger a snow avalanche. And anything that is higher or steeper than uh, 30 degrees, so 30 to 45 and 45 to 70, of course, is so steep that you tend to get rock falls and um, landslides just because it's so steep. Mm -hmm. by, okay. Then by clicking the little arrow at the top to go back, we end up back in here. We can, yeah, we don't need to change anything. This one is maybe easier if we change it to that one, but it's not a big deal. Uh, should work anyhow. You can specify a file name, um, for example, slope map reclass, something like this, and then run the tool. And then we end up with something that shows us basically the four classes that we defined. It's right on top of everything else, so but that's OK. If we double click and go into Symbology, uh, need to go onto uh, single bound pseudo color. 
And now in order to really have the four classes that we just defined to also show here, we need to change the mode, basically the statistics on how it's divided up to equal interval. Specify four classes. We can change the color ramp to something like this. You can also click on the single colors and pick a color for each, like on the single uh, class colors and pick one for each. Say apply and OK. And basically, so we see that how the mountain range is here. If I click there and make it a little bit transparent, if I turn on. Yeah, it's too dense still. But basically, we can very well recognize the two ridges um, that come here together. The river, if I drag that quickly on top here, this is where the river goes through. And for example, the restaurant that got flooded that we went visit last year, it's just here. So right after this uh, very um, narrow section where everything has to sort of squish through. So of course, then the water came with a lot of power and height uh, through the valley here, uh, destroying this zone. So since I see that time has quite progressed already, we'll skip for now the further analysis part and we are moving to the visualization. Just so you have seen how to access that, because this is already a kind of nice output. Of course, we can color it much better. I mean, we can drag the buildings on top, although it's almost a bit big. Um, we may not need uh, everything turned on here. Ah, yeah, so this is better. Ah, that's why it showed. Uh, I had my others, my original slope map was still turned on, and therefore uh, that looked a bit cluttered or less uh, intuitive as I thought it would be. Maybe we can give it even a bit more transparency to 50. Okay, we can still nicely see the dark colors of the slope gradients map, which we created, which indicates the areas that are um, most prone to uh, landslides and avalanches. And therefore, of course, anything that's below depending on the size of the avalanche or the slide, uh, would be exposed uh, to that material coming down the mountain. Now, of course, this is hard to share with anyone like this. What we want to do now is click on project and say new print layout. It will ask us for a name. You can type slope, uh, gradient, map, and say OK. And you see, it opens like almost, it looks almost like another QGIS project opened, but that's not the case. This is the layout manager of QGIS. 
and you actually need to have both open more or less, well it's easier if you have both open at the same time the project and your layout creator this is your blank page of course you can change all the paper settings to whatever you need them to be like in any um, layouting tool and right now though we need to figure out how we can add the stuff that we see here in the back and that is done through this icon here which is called add map if we select that we end up with this cross which we can just drag across our white sheet and that will automatically take the canvas extent that we have um, in our QJS project and display it here if we want to now if we try to move the map or, or position it that doesn't work because we would just move here this extent which we can also size to anything that we want to be practical there are a couple of elements we need to add so leave a little bit of space around and in order to place the map inside the extent better or zoom in um, we can I think it's this one click here sometimes I can yeah you see now I zoomed in voila and we are getting zoomed in make it a bit more comprehensive of the area that we are interested in And now we want to add a title as well, or label. It's basically just a text box. We can select where it's placed. We don't need to worry too much about position and size. We can still change that. Voila. And in order to edit the text that is now set to lorem ipsum, um, we need to go here in the main properties and say yeah slow, give it the title slope gradient map well now we can you see center change the font etc we can fiddle around here for a very really, really long time until we are happy however it's a bit small right now so position and size we leave here font size so now we make it smaller like that then of course we also need a north arrow indicating the direction i'll put it on the right upper corner and a scale bar that's always useful at the bottom yeah try like that yep. because of course we also need a legend so sometimes uh, one struggles to fit that in so there's a scale bar if you want to have a white background behind the scale bar you can either move it there might be a way in the scale bar item properties to set a background color or you go and um, select add shape rectangle and you paint a rectangle in order to um, make it be below the scale bar just change the order here on the items list yeah not perfect but yeah one can spend hours doing this hours 
And of course, let's see if we are good with the legend. Maybe here. And you see it shows us everything that we have in the layer panel on our QGIS project, which we don't need at all. So we can change that. I'm just making this a little bit bigger by scrolling down here in the items property of the legend. Unselect auto update. And now we basically don't need any other layers. I'm just right, uh, working with, uh, no, it doesn't work. Shift, control, shift. No, I have to work this way. Scroll down, delete what we don't want. And this doesn't delete the layers from your project. It will just delete them from you, your legend. So it's... Dun -dun. Uh, delete. Voila. And there we go. I have a little map. Um, in order to adapt this better, we would have to um, change it here. Sorry, now I probably lost you. Um, so in order to display the degrees in a better way, uh, we have to go into the symbology um, settings of the slope map reclassified uh, layer here. We can also change the name here in order to uh, make more sense. For now, I quickly save my layout again. Throw this down. Again, uh, rename. The layer. Two. So gradients. And oh, I should be able to. Yeah. No. Doesn't let me do what I want. Legend settings. If we went degrees, does it help us? No. Right now, well, sort of. <laughs> right, but there is a, I can maybe also jump to create new styles, etc. Plenty of ways to do things. Uh, Did everyone manage to create a little layout? Because if yes, one can click on layout at the top and for example, say export as PDF. Project and put it in our output folder if we want. Click on save and voila, we created a little slope gradient map. Not yet happy with this legend, but we'll fix that some other stage as well. Is everyone, is anyone entirely lost? I need to show something again, because otherwise I'm, 
I see that it's 10 to 3. And maybe I quickly talk you through the couple more slides that I have. Um, this is basically what we did. Um, you see here avalanches or slopes between or slopes between 30 to 45 degrees are particularly susceptible to avalanches. Snow tends to accumulate on these slopes and the combination of gravity and the weight of the snowpack can trigger an avalanche. For, for landslides, slopes steeper than 30 degrees are generally considered high risk for landslides, especially if there are contributing factors like heavy rainfall, earthquakes, deforestation, construction activities that stabilize the slope. So that can already give a good idea of what areas or where one should maybe not build or yeah, build a house or live etc. We have seen, so QGIS has other ways of, of working with data as well. We went through the GDAL tools by creating the slope map, hill shade map or the contours, uh, which sort of offer ways of displaying the map in different, like, especially terrain in, in different ways for people to better understand where it's going up and where it's going down, for example. But there is lots more as well. Also, not only for rasters, but also for vector files. So anything that's a line, polygon or point. Um, there is also what we've seen in the toolbox are often the grass GIS. Um, tools which uh, provide geospatial data management and analysis, uh, image processing, producing graphics and maps, and also provides tools for spatial and temporal modeling. So temporal modeling that would, for example, be the change detection over time. And then we have the Saga GIS tools, which either come directly installed with your QGIS. If not, one has to go on to, uh, to the Saga webpage, which I'll be sharing here too, um, which allows you to download a set of tools for geoscientific analysis. Becomes rather statistical then, but can also be very important. Don't, I don't think we have time to do the flood analysis part. Um, however, I'd like to talk you quickly through on what the methodology could be, or at least one of them, and show you um, how that result can look like. And basically, um, the approach I chose is to take the river Emme, um, which I was able to extract from the OSM data. I clip it to the um, area of interest. And then I use the elevation data that we clipped at the start. And the idea is to basically, um, yeah, with having the line for the river, uh, and the elevation data, we combine the two to understand what the elevation is of the riverbed at each and every point. For that, one has to basically convert the line, the river line feature to points. There is a tool for that to create points along geometry. Then one has to sort of like intersect those points with the elevation data with the sample raster values tool in order to assign the elevation from the elevation data layer to the points along the riverbed to then simulate a higher like water level in the river i decided to just add three meters to that elevation so wherever um, a point in the riverbed is originally at 800 meters. I add three meters, so it's 803. And I do that for each point. 
and now I'm interested to create a surface out of these points because I want to see what happens um, on each side of the riverbed if the water would be that high. And for that, I used the interpolation tool, which would then just create over the extent of the area, um, interpolate elevation points based on my riverbed points that are three meters higher now. Once I have this layer, I can subtract it from the elevation data and then um, display basically all the positive values, which would assume that these are areas where the water could end up in. And that would look like this. It sort of coincides where three meters is maybe um, a bit exaggerated, but yeah. I'm sure Georg Harz has the more precise data. And of course, if one works with the data that is provided by the country, potentially in the more, in a preciser um, projection and with a more precise theory, this, and uh, yeah, then you, you end up with a more realistic scenario. However, I think it's not too bad. I think we were around here last time or even here and we could see that the river had at uh, the time that it did flood definitely go across uh, the riverbed and flooded these lower sections here which we can also recognize by the contour lines other ways to do this um, i was a bit forced to choose a bit this more complicated approach um, in this case, because actually the, the valley descends from here to here by around 250 meters. If, for example, around Basel, Rheinfelden, where there is the Rhine, the River Rhine, or throughout Germany, there's the River Rhine, it actually doesn't do much elevation change ever. It's pretty flat. Then one also, opla, where did we go? One could just choose to classify elevation data for any area that is basically below 10 meters. And then you have a simple estimation of areas that are potentially or more likely to be flooded in case uh, of the water escaping the riverbed. Of course, we can also simply use the contour lines to create an area or yeah, basically a polygon um, surface within a, uh, yeah, within, for example, the, the lowest contour line that we have here, which would be sort of along or at the bottom of the valley. Or then you were outside like we did last, year and walked along the river and you noted down somewhere visual markers or you took GPS coordinates of these points and then you create a polygon based on these points which would indicate how far the went, how far the water went in that event. Of course, well, what we've seen with uh, Georg's tool um, that also considers precipitation, soil type, vegetation, and elevation data, you get the more precise output. But if ever you are stuck, I think this would be, these are good tools to have in your sort of back pocket. Even if you just create some contour lines and then an open street map layer, and you make a little A4 PDF out of it, and that's what you go out with into the field, and then with pens, uh, you're marking spots or you're using that to communicate with people. I think that's already um, very good to have. This is what we did. And I think, yeah, 
some useful takeaways I have for you is that the OpenStreetMap is a simple way to update a map or features if they are missing somewhere and then to export that data into a shapefile and bring that into your GIS software in order to use it there for analysis or displaying it's better or the way you need it to be displayed. Um, QGIS is open source, it costs nothing. Um, you can view, analyze and visualize all sorts of spatial data like shape files, KMLs, TIFF, etc. And has a huge knowledge base. Um, it requires a bit of time and as you see there are many the interface is complex. There are many tools and one can easily get lost. And this is uh, normal. <laughs> uh, even I have to go and dig around for things. You saw also the, the symbology type of stuff is uh, can be very complex as well. And that takes just time. It's not straight, straightforward. But I think with the tools I showed you now, you can already create decent little maps that will uh, help you with your work. Then the QGIS plugins um, enable for, for example, the download of OpenStreetMap data uh, or satellite imagery. Last year, I shared a list with potential sources for data um, as well. Uh, it's always tricky to get the data that is also pretty normal. Um, and the plugins also have, offer other tools. So you could also be looking for other type of satellite imagery. Um, doesn't have to be Sentinel. There, there are lots of others out there too. And then there is a, don't forget about Google Earth Pro as sort of a little useful GIS tool as well, um, where Google Earth Pro is actually for free since a long time by now and you can easily, there one mainly works with KML files, but that works as well. KML or KM set, where by the way, a KM set file is just a zipped or compressed KML file. And then Microsoft Excel, if you have access to it, I think it doesn't work on company versions, but on personal licenses is that you can create a map chart based on Excel data directly in Excel. Uh, the link that I'll be sharing with you here will take you to a full um, explanation of how that can work if you want to. Yeah, mm -hmm. and with this, I hope I didn't overwhelm you too much mm -hmm. today and thanks for hanging in there. It's rather tiring to do these things. Um, <laughs> for everyone but uh yeah i hope you got to take away some stuff and don't get depressed by the complexity mm -hmm. this is uh <laughs> this is normal <laughs> yeah <clears throat> when i see the faces um i see a bit of um being overwhelmed uh, as i am as well <laughs> you know um but as you said um you need to practice um and um for me you know i'm I haven't been exposed to GIS um, very often, so mm -hmm. much is new and of course I'm overwhelmed. Uh, mm -hmm. But thanks a lot for uh, having provided us um, a bit, a, a glimpse into the potentials and possibilities what there is in working with a GIS. Um, yeah, I have to digest it, but you know, yeah. the good <laughs> thing is it is there and I can go and uh, have a look and get back to it, etc. So um, that's for me, at least that 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 is very helpful. And it's I can understand that it can become uh, that it can get really fascinating working with it and also that you can that you can get lost in, in doing it. Uh, yeah, so so much that you can do, you know, and maybe half a per, half a percent what we have been looked at now. You know, it's, uh, whoa, yeah. So, but I hope um, that the learning journey was um, as instructive um, and useful to you as it, as, as, I was, as it was for me. Um, any questions from your side? I still see three survivors. With me, it's four. <laughs> huh? 
And Nicolas, it was the first time you joined here for the second part. Come to you were um, also the last. All, all five uh, uh -huh. okay. modules. And as I mentioned at the beginning, it would be good if uh, you could uh, provide a certificate of attendance or uh, something like that. Uh, for example, here we work uh, with IFRC. If they have um, any training related to this, and then if uh, a person doesn't have any uh, background about the field, so they would not uh, invite us to join, for example. So if if we have okay. the certificate, uh, we can see what we can do. Huh? OK, <laughs> thank <laughs> you. Thanks, Connie. <laughs> Any other thing? Okay. Well, if so, any of you have any questions or need some help uh, with GIS, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. Okay, that's very kind. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we might Only come I'm, back. I'm, up, I'm often in Bern as well, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But you see, see, my first my first address is Georg, and if ever he thought he wouldn't know how to do, then now we'll come to you. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks a lot, Andrea. Huh? Thanks again. And yeah. thanks um, to all of you. Um, I think that's that's it for today. Have a nice day. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Huh? Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone.